Well, good morning, Dr. Jeffrey. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for taking the time and being with us. How are you doing today? Yeah, I'm doing really good. It's a nice sunny day over here. So it's cooler on the coast, so it's really nice. Excellent. That's great. Well, let's kick off with some backstory. You know, how did you get into naturopathic medicine? What's the what was the journey? Yeah, well, it's been a long journey. And I guess anybody in this field probably has their journey that's quite, quite, quite a quite a time. But uh, for me, I guess when I was in younger, I had lots of questions. I had lots of questions for my primary care doctor and lots of things of what I can do to empower my health, to make myself healthier and better. Um, and so I just found over the, over the years that I wasn't getting those questions answered um, and really had that. I guess I, what I was really looking for was almost like a coaching kind of approach to healthcare. And um, over the years, I kind of kind of did my own thing and kind of worked with worked with healthcare providers. And then uh, eventually, I was kind of brought to natu naturopathic medicine, and I kind of uh, resonated with the philosophy and that it matched and was in alignment what I was looking for. So that really motivated me. Um, I also had some health challenges at the time too. So. I jumped into it with a naturopathic doctor and kind of worked on some, some things and had a really good response in a, in a fairly short period of time. And, uh, and then I decided to continue on and do this for, for my career. All right. Is there a particular reason you, you, you went towards natural medicine rather than maybe conventional? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I was a biochemistry kind of focus in my undergrad degree and I was always thought I would go into research so I was really really kind of centered on going maybe into the pharmaceuticals or, or working in that industry and when it came down to it I, I started having health problems so um, and so I had things like concentration difficulties and, and reading difficulties and those weren't things that really could be fixed with the conventional system I also had like overload kind of symptoms uh, and so what I was kind of forced to look outside the box, I guess, uh, after trying many, many years of the conventional approach, I was kind of searching and, and I was really impressed with herbal medicine and all these things that were all very new to me. And they had a pretty uh, quick effect. And, and after that, uh, all, and, uh, as well as nutrition, nutrition was a big part of my journey now. And and doing all those changes had such a big improvement in my concentration and, and my overload symptoms and, and eventually was uh, able to kind of uh, get back on track with my, with my health and, and get finished off my undergraduate degree in, in biochemistry. And uh, then I decided I wanted to go that route. I wanted to go the more the nutritional route and work with people with these things that didn't fit in in the box and weren't being kind of slipping through the cracks. Good decision. That's great. I'm sure a lot of people have benefited from that decision. That's awesome. Um, just looking out through your website um, on um, perceptive health, your interests on your little bio include the gut brain connection, autonomic balance in neurodiversity and anxiety, trigger point injections and therapeutic ketogenic diet. Some interesting stuff there, some really like big topics. Can you tell us a little bit more about the autonomic balance in neurodiversity and how that relates to mental health and maybe um, explain a little bit like what autonomic means and maybe neurodiversity for people who aren't, aren't super sciencey? Yeah, <clears throat> so the, the, the topic of neurodiversity is quite a big topic. Came out, I believe originally the, the term kind of came from the autism community actually. And over the years, that community was very large and, and grown and quite supportive of looking at the brain as being uh, different, as possibly different, uh, just like we look at any trait in society, in our, in biology, we look on at what, you know, under a bell curve and, and a lot of people fit under that bell curve, but there's always going to be people on the outsides that might have different traits and really in a, and experience the world a little bit differently. So that's where neurodiversity came from. And then a lot of practitioners are now kind of extending it to uh, lots of different uh, brain health conditions, both mental health conditions and as well as, as well as neurological conditions. And what 
the nice thing about neurodiversity is that it really focuses our attention on some positive qualities that these differences in interpreting the world kind of bring. And they also highlight the importance for support in certain areas as well. So, um, so many people might experience uh, lots of sensory sensitivities, so we can support that, but they also may have gifts and concentrate and focus and, and getting things done and, and hyper-focusing, we call that. So, um, so the, the, the approach there that I take is kind of like helping people unwind their nervous system and, 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 uh, and how they can use their gifts and how they can support their things that they need to support. Now, going into the autonomic nervous system, um, I've always found that fascinating and, uh, and I've done lots of research and I started off with anxiety and understanding anxiety from an autonomic perspective. And I found that a lot of people, and there was also a lot of research that was showing that something called heart rate variability in people with anxiety or other mental health conditions would often be different. It might be a little bit lower. And what that means is that there is, <clears throat> the autonomic nervous system is in charge of our fight or flight nervous system and our rest and digest form of nervous, nervous system there. So, so sorry, just, just, just to back, backtrack a little bit. So when we're talking about autonomic, you know, that's one part of our nervous system, which is like, you know, automatic, as you say, fight or flight, you know, it kind of it, it, it engages itself depending on, you know, what we foresee in our environment. When we perceive a threat, mm -hmm. our autonomic nervous system kind of kicks into gear and it's kind of like always there ready to, to go. It's not something that we really have any control over. I mean, mm -hmm. to some extent, potentially we do, but like, you know, it's really like it's, it's, it's put in there in a, for us kind of survival mechanism. Can you kind of talk a little bit about like, the foundational aspects of like the autonomic nervous system just to give people yeah, a little I bit guess... of an intro do you know you know what i mean yeah so on one side there's the sympathetic nervous system and that's our fight or flight it's kind of the the side of and it controls all the functions in our body to help us respond to our environment when there's lots of stress so we've all experienced the fight or flight uh like we've um, stood up in a public place to talk and we get that heart rate increasing, we start to sweat, we start to uh, um, lose maybe our concentration. Those are all the fight or flight. And it's meant to really help you respond and uh, to, that, to that stressful environment and to get through it. And then on the other side is our parasympathetics. That's our, I like to call the rest and digest system. So that controls all of our calming properties, restorative properties, as well as our digestion. It also slows the heart rate down. So if we were to put like a, a balance, balancing beam when, in, with this model, when the sympathetic nervous system is high and you're in a fight or flight, this parasympathetic nervous system is gonna be low, So, which makes sense. And then we have to bring our parasympathetic nervous system up, which is kind of like putting the brakes on the sympathetic fight or flight response. And when we do that, we calm that area down and the uh, calming and, and, di and rest and digest functions predominate. That makes sense. So if somebody just on this seesaw that you're saying, so somebody is like in a really stressful month, so the stress is really high, you know, workload, family and, and all this, and you've got the rest and digest, which is taking a bit of a backseat. Would that mean that um, things like sleep, and digestion there's not going to be as many resources allocated to those areas because everything's kind of like focusing on this stressful environment so therefore like you could be having some like digestive issues and some sleep issues yeah exactly so when that is out of balance <clears throat> we see a lot yeah we see people experiencing a lot of kind of anxiety low-grade anxiety and well it can shift up to almost like a panic kind of feeling so we get that and as well on, because that parasympathetic nervous system is down, um, we also get a lot of digestive upsets. So we see people with either IBS-like symptoms when, when that, and um, constipation and, and um, 
And we also see people just having a hard time relaxing and a hard time sleeping as well. So um, it, it's a nice model to kind of check in with because it's our physiology and and um, and the nice thing about the physiology is we can we can work on physiology and help improve it. That's great. Yeah, that makes that that makes a lot of sense. So when it comes to you know working with someone with neurodiversity and that just kind of like if I just break that word down for myself, my my own personal understanding, you know, we're all obviously very very different in our makeup and especially our brain considering we all, we all grow up and in very very different environments so our brains, you know, are wildly different even though you know they're kind of the same mechanisms and it's made up of the same stuff but you know my relationship to anxiety might be very different to somebody else's so when you're looking at that when you're looking at a client coming in and you you know you're looking at that autonomic nervous system that that, that balance between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic how do you go about approaching kind of initially how diverse somebody is like what kind of where do they kind of like lean to in regards to their neurodiversity makeup is there a set of like questions or something there that you you would go through well when it comes to the neurodiversity it's more what the people are saying and their experiences and how they're connecting to the world so that comes a lot out in when people share their experience so with people in neurodiversity they might have uh for example, the experience with te attention difficulties, and that might be manifesting more like an ADHD kind of picture. And then others may have difficulties with socializing and uh, communicating and, uh, and, and that might be more in the autism side of things. Um, so that's where um, we kind of bring the focus and there's lots of screening and screening questionnaires that you could do for that as well. So uh, for anxiety screening questionnaires, for autism screening questionnaires and, and things as sensory sensitivities, there's lots of information there. So we almost always kind of use, use that to kind of see, you know, what focus we need to be putting our effort towards. Then on the autonomic side of things, we, um, can look at using biofeedback equipment and we can run things like the most common thing I run is a heart rate variability test. So it's just a heart rate monitor and we look at the rate of their heart rate, but we also look at the, um, how much it changes over time. And that's one, a really nice marker because it's something we could, we can easily run in the office and it's something that we can, um, we can look at it and if it, it tends to be on the lower side, uh, then we uh, start to think that maybe there might be more sympathetic overload in that person. And no matter what the health condition they're coming in for, if they do have a lot of sympathetic overload, then it might also mean that the parasympathetics are downregulated and we need that for, for, again, our digestion, calming ourselves down, sleeping properly, that kind of thing. So we kind of combine the two things and we get it a snapshot of where we can improve. And then we give people exercises to improve if they're, if they're, we find that there is a deficiency. Interesting. And when you say, when you're using that heart rate um, monitor, when you say lower, do you mean, does that mean like a weaker signal or a weaker heartbeat or incoherence there? What does that, what does that kind of mean that, that would lead you towards um, a particular focus there? Well, there's a couple of different biomarkers that we can take calculations that we could take from the raw data. And so it gives us a, you know, heart rate variability gives us a number and it might be say a 56 and that's kind of a common number. And uh, if all of a sudden we see like a 35 or anything like something like that, um, we may think that there's a lower heart rate variability. So this is, it's kind of a big concept to explain, but when sure. there is, uh, the heart rate variability is the ability for our brain to alter our heart rate. So our heart will beat automatically all by itself and that's controlled by the heart. When the brain kind of starts to modify the heart, it creates this variability. And the more variability, the higher variability tells us there's more nervous system coming down saying, start up, slow down, 
or involvement um, from the from, from the brain. Yeah, okay. yeah. Interesting. And that's so a higher heart rate variability is associated with higher parasympathetics because that's what controls our heart rate and often slows it down. So, <clears throat> so if I all of a sudden see someone with a very low heart rate variability, um, then um, we work on kind of support supporting them through through exercises like breathing exercises is our most common thing to help to help strengthen it. Yeah, I was going to ask can. you like are there are a couple of like key things that people can do to yeah you know can, even when they start feeling their sensations of stress or anxiety you know I know that there are a couple of things that we can do quite quickly to help um, engage or disengage that stre that stress fight or flight response and, and kind of bring in that rest and digest that you were talking about so you know bre breathing exercises is one of them yeah yeah it is and it's quite profound and what I really like too about when we do this heart rate variability stuff is often a live biofeedback so I can show people right then and there when you're doing the breathing work at your specific frequency um, <clears throat> and it's often different for everybody and that's also very interesting and that it'll bring up the heart rate variability right there we can see it and, the, and people feel the response so it really kind of makes us uh, for me it really connected me with the importance of breath work and also finding the breath work pattern that works best for you for for the individual and that's there's lots of diversity in that some people uh, require the most common breath uh, frequency that we breathe is a say a three seconds in and a, and a four seconds out uh, most people will feel a relaxation response with that kind of warming in the hands is what you would look for uh, less you know calmer sensation um, whereas other people um, they might have they're going to have a total Sorry, I just, uh, just cut out the feed there. I can't hear you. Over time. And it's something that, and another thing too, more I look at, more I learned about a heart rate variability and autonomics, more I realized that you have to think of it as like an exercise, like going to the gym and continuing the practice. And you need to continue practicing it for, you know, at least three to six weeks to, to start to feel responses. And a lot of research is showing up to, up to 10 weeks is kind of needed. So that reinforces the importance of just continuing on with it if you don't necessarily feel it as strongly right away. All right. Is there a common, some, so say for some, somebody who's coming in to see you who is engaged in a sympathetic fight or flight nervous system response all like pretty much all the time. Are there some common physiological symptoms that you might see in that individual? who is like constantly stressed and is like always in the sympathetic and the, and the parasympathetic is just like not really ever really involved. <clears throat> yeah, we're going to see lots of the heart rate might even be elevated. So their, their heart rate might slowly go up throughout the day as the sympathetics engage um, even more throughout the day. Um, so that's going to be one big thing. That, and it's often like, you know, it starts to go up and it might be sitting at say a heart rate of 90 throughout the day and moving around, it might be over a hundred. So we, we look at that and say, okay, that, that shows that, that they're in sympathetic overload. Um, but also just feelings of just difficulty breathing is another thing, just like feeling of shortness of breath um, and also digestive upset. So a, a stomach ache, um, constipation is really common because these are all needed for your, your parasympathetics need need to be engaged to to digest yeah it certainly makes a lot of sense when you think about it as that seesaw where you've got that sympathetic side of things where you know it's obviously very important that we do have that nervous system engaged sometimes but we obviously want to be more focused on this parasympathetic side that's you know to do with rest digest repair and all those you know really good good things that we really need to be make, make sure are happening in regards to you know feeling well and healthy and recovering um so that's yeah that's a really good um foundational insight into like the autonomic nervous system and neurodiversity uh thank you very much for that i think uh, i'd love to talk more about the the gut brain connection another one of your interests and i think a lot of people are familiar with the gut brain connection i think over the last few years it's had a lot of um 
like detraction kind of all over the place. And I think a lot of people have probably just heard of it rather than really understanding what that connection actually is. So could you give us maybe a little bit of a rundown to what the brain gut connection is and why it's important that people should you know, be paying attention to it? Yeah, so this is another area that's really fascinating. And there's so many different ways uh, that our brain and our gut are connected. So the first is the gut brain connection. So we've, you know, a lot of things are coming out of research showing that um, our, our gut and the health of our gut strongly correlates with the health of our brain. Um, and we've also found that there is potentially connections um, feeding back to the brain and actually might modify or modulate areas in our brain. So one area, <clears throat> one area that, that could be is probiotics and bacteria in our microbiome and our gut, our gut bacteria. Uh, we think in, that they produce uh, neurotransmitters, uh, potentially neurotransmitters like GABA or things that have a, a relaxation effect and they feed back to the brain and might kind of calm areas of the brain. Um, so, and we also find that maybe pat, maybe what we call dysbiotic bacteria may also produce more excitatory things and, and cause our, ourselves to feel a little more on edge. So that's probably the most, one of the most fascinating areas that I find uh, because it really tells us the importance of working on our gut and sorting out the gut in order to, uh, alongside supporting our brain. Um, there's also the connection between, there's also what we call a nervous system connection through the vagus nerve and we think that maybe microbiome might be connecting through the vagus nerve and connecting with our brain that way. And we also know that our brain connects through the vagus nerve with our gut as well. Um, so there's also uh, our, our probiotics and microbiome. They also influence our nutritional status and they, they produce things like B vitamins and folate, which are also important for good uh, brain health as well. Um, so there's qu it's quite a, va a vast area. Um, the other area is the brain gut connection and how we uh, kind of what we already talked about through the autonomic stuff, but just the importance of how just balancing our brain also can help balance our gut. Yeah, it's, it's wild how much of our nervous system resides in our gut. And then if you think about when you have a gut feeling about something, you know, that makes a lot of sense considering the outrageous amount of um, nervous nervous tissue that we have inside of our gut that's absolutely connected. I was going to ask you about like, you know, we obviously know that the body is so beautifully connected in ways that we'll probably never understand. But there is that kind of pathway via the vagus nerve where the it seems that the brain and the gut communicate. And yeah, there's quite a bit, a bit of ev evidence now that shows that, you know, our microbiome, our, our you know, microorganisms that reside in our gut actually, you know, use this as kind of like a highway and um, that communication is, is ongoing. And I found in my, in my nutrition practice that the, the kind of more diverse and healthier somebody's microbiome is, the, um, the better their, you know, kind of stress response is and their nervous system. And yeah, it's, it's just an interesting correlation and it's kind of a new, yeah, as you say, it's a new area and more and more information is coming out day by day, especially when um, this, the vast amounts of microorganisms that live in there and the different jobs that they do and how they interact with each other and then interact with our own cells. It's, uh, it's a quite remarkable field. Yeah, quite a, quite a neat expanding area. And it's, yeah, a lot is coming out of research. So it's an area that keep, everybody should keep their eye on because we might be, we're entering into this new area. <laughs> absolutely. We... Yeah, absolutely. What, um, what do you think people can do as kind of an initial step to begin um, helping their gut and their brain connect in a healthier way? Like what, what, what are some things I can kind of do like right now that's going to support that powerful, intimate connection? <clears throat> yeah, so there could be things like, you know, if we're de not dealing with any major, major, you know, bacterial overgrowths and stuff like that. Just supporting your microbiome through fermented foods and good soluble fiber uh, can, can really help foster the diversity in, in your gut. So um, yeah, really emphasize the, the, the veggies 
and to give yourself soluble and insoluble fiber to help feed the bacteria. Um, that will allow our bacteria in our colon to produce uh, things like butyric acid to help fuel the colon cells and, and also help create a better environment. Um, so there's that side of things. So really getting off of processed foods as much as possible and eating a whole foods diet really can switch uh, as well as reducing sugar and you know going on some lower sugar kind of kind of diet, simple sugars, just getting away from them can really help because they also, if you're feeding our bi microbiome, our microbiome becomes, we, we select the microorganisms based on the food we're eating. So if we're selecting, eating a lot of sugary foods, we're selecting a lot of things that love sugar. And those are often what we call the dysbiosis bacteria. Yeah, I think it's, it's incredible that how diverse our diets used to be and then how diverse our microorganisms used to be. And then now, like, I think people probably consume maybe between, I don't know, 10 and 30 different foods a week, you know, not very diverse. We, you know, we, we go to the same restaurants, we shop, in the, we, we shop in the same places and kind of pick the same things. And um, sometimes our options are quite limited. But yeah, like in comparison to maybe, let's say a couple hundred years ago, where we would have an outrageous amount of food kind of around us growing. And then now, you know, with with the technologies and everything of 2021 our, our populations our diversity and our, and our gut are somewhat maybe a little bit weaker yeah and the other thing i always i'm reminded too is like when we were eating more straight from our gardens we were getting more of maybe the spore-based probiotics through just through a little bit of contamination which was good and so those also probably have an effect on human physiology as well yeah, that's a really, really, really good point. Do you use any um, like gut testing kits or have you got any experience with those? Yeah, um, the mo we do a lot of bacterial overgrowth breath tests. That's probably okay. one of our biggest ones because it's, it's, it's a nice, it's a, something you can identify fairly quickly and easily. Um, and then we do lots of comprehensive digestive analysis tests, which uh, look at the microbiome, um, diversity, and we look at how diverse it is. Then we also look at par look for parasites and see if they're present. Um, we look at the stool chemistry to see if there's blood in the stool, but also inflammatory markers in the gut lining. Um, and we also look at how well uh, we're digesting our food, look for any undigested food to determine if we might need to support uh, enzymes as, as well. Yeah, so we do quite a bit of that as well. Mm -hmm. That's great. It's probably a lot of encouraging people to take a look in the toilet bowl a little bit more, right? Because it can, it can <laughs> yeah. tell you a hell of a lot. Yeah, it's pretty, it, it ends up being pretty fascinating. Yeah. Um, some, we've also worked in the past a lot, a little bit with um, the, the microbiome through genetic testing as well in the, in the stool, in the stool. And that's also, come back with some pretty fascinating results too amazing awesome well i'd love to switch up a little bit and talk about um your clinical experience using empower plus our you know our flagship product here at true hope canada um yeah can you tell us a little bit about your your experience um using that product and and how and how it supported your clients yeah well over the years i've always done lots of research and kind of you know and as a naturopathic doctor i understood the importance of good nutrition and just overall supporting the body as being a really good first step. And so that's always kind of been my, my philosophy for treating the brain is, is first just like looking for nutritional deficiencies and clarifying nutritional deficiencies. And I've always just been impressed with the amount of research out there that there is on nutritional deficiencies um, as being important for our, our brain health. So that kind of was nice. Uh, that's that's kind of how I use the True Hope product, the MP, as I I dose people, you know, with a nice, good, high, high dose of it to clarify <clears throat> common nutritional deficiencies. Um, I also really like it because it does contain lots of things in it. And, and sometimes it can be hard to, when someone is experiencing kind of anxiety or, or mental health condition, it can be hard to take a bunch of different things. So if I just say, take from one bottle, take three of three AMP, twice a day or even three times a day in some cases, then it just seems to be easier and we can, and people can do it at the beginning a lot easier. 
Um, so I like the way it also has the antioxidants and and as as well as as the and the minerals and, and the nutrients. And overall, <clears throat> so if someone is, for example, having digestive upset, I often will treat the digestive system and then we will put in the, the micro, the nutrients after. Um, and I do treat a lot of digestive stuff. Um, so, so that's kind of how I, how I approach it. I, I find that the people who have been on the EMP for long periods of time end up supporting the, they tend to be more symptom free in the long term and they tend to be managing better. Um, and that's just from my clinical experience uh, from using EMP and why I continue to use it. Interesting. Yeah, I think that um, in my personal experience as well, the fact that, you know, going to see a naturopathic doctor or going to see a, a health practitioner for a specific reason and then, you know, going to, you know, then continuing to do work to help heal yourself. And um, that can sometimes be like a, you know, a difficult thing to, to undertake so if you're you know if you're if you're um adding a micronutrient that's going to support your brain health it's certainly going to help you be able to deal with the kind of added extra things you have to do in your life to you know to, to become conscious and aware of and to, to keep those things up i've certainly found that to be um to be very very helpful whilst people are you know making kind of big health changes so that's really yeah that's a, that's a really important part and i and i i love what you're saying about the um the fact that you know, a lot of people who do have digestive issues, who do have like an inflamed gut, and once you kind of can help rectify that and, and bring that inflammation down a little bit, taking a micronutrient supplement that's really bioavailable can really you know, help people who do have compromised digestive systems be able to absorb some more nutrients. And the fact that, yeah, it's, you know, it's so many ingredients inside of this just one product that uh, people are going to be getting, you know, kind of a full rounded um, holistic product that's going to be able to sort them in su to support them in many different ways. When did you when did you first hear about EMP or True Hope Canada? When how did it come across your um, awareness? <clears throat> um, well, I heard about it when I first started practicing and then and then I practiced with another doctor that was using it quite a bit. Um, and then and then, you know, more so I started gravitating towards things that were just things that were easier for the patients to, to do. I was doing a lot of like individual things when I first started practicing, like just individual nutrients and okay. that would be the multivitamin. It was multi, multi uh, pill bottles. Multi bottles. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was just, I was getting really just some bad low compliance and, and, and difficulties with people with the routine, right? And it seemed like it was their entire day was just dedicated to taking their stuff throughout the day when there was more than like five or six bottles to get that yeah. many nutrients. So then I started to think of ways I could simplify it. And about three years ago, I really just started, I, I started, I'm just going to focus on, on getting their nutrient status up with the EMP and, and it just made it easier for the clients. And I still, at the same point, we'll still do specific nutrients to do to help with calming properties and and stuff throughout throughout the the process um but yeah it's really simplified my treatment and and made it more effective and people stick with their treatment longer as well yeah we find it to be really supportive for kind of like most people you know originally designed as a product to support people with you know, bipolar disorder but we found out that you know this wild wild spectrum of of um, mental disorders and even just kind of like mild stress we find it to be as you say supportive across that spectrum and the fact that you know you would add something sp more specific to to that kind of treatment regimen that would um that would connect with that particular case yeah it's just like a really great foundational nutritional level and you know we've kind of we kind of touched on the quality of the food and the the soil that we have today i honestly believe that you know everybody could benefit from a product from a micronutrient that's you know th that's well made and, ha and has a lot of science science to back it up as a good quality product i think that we can all benefit from that foundational nutrition and if it's something that we can take in a capsule that we can take every day that's kind of easy and a lot simpler that's um it's going to support a lot of people do you um mm -hmm. 
how, how do you feel like a micronutrient product can support that gut brain connection that, that we're talking about? <clears throat> Yeah, that, well, that's a good, in, that's an interesting question. Um, a lot of the times when we are, in, we in certain phases of our digestive protocols, we really want to support the micronutrient status because we're not, we may have not been absorbing the minerals, for example, and our stomach acid is is low um, for long periods of time. We may not have been absorbing things like zinc and, and magnesium and, and all these things that we need. And so when we get people, their gut sorted out we then put them on some micronutrients and it really helps kind of replete their system again the way i think about it um, i'm especially interested with minerals i think minerals are really important for the brain in ways we're just learning and <clears throat> and how uh, i find i wonder if when someone has compromised digestive system if if their mineral status has been low for a long period of time so so yeah and that's so these key nutrients that they've been missing out get repleted pretty quickly after we um, get sort out the underlying contributing factors to their gut health. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because we obviously have a lot of bacteria and other microorganisms that um, produce and manufacture micronutrients, certain micronutrients for us that we can't really do as humans on our own. Um, so taking taking a product that is you know bioavailable and you know easy, very easily absorbed can help you know deal with the the current digestive things that are going on then once you can deal with those and start increasing that microbiome diversity and you know start uh, allowing those um, bacteria that do all those wonderful jobs for us that's just going to be able to support you on your way to um you know kind of healing as you say like the the root bigger things mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, I'd love to kind of finish off. I just I had a little look through the website um, this morning, and I noticed you've got a, a free three day gut health like diet program video series. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Because that's I think that's a great resource that people can um, get to to you know start learning a little bit more about their their gut health and what they can actually do. You know, like it's 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 good to know, but knowing how is even mm -hmm. even more powerful. Yeah, so what we have in our website is just, uh, it's kind of like an example of what we give at our office, but we always give, you know, at least one to two week meal plans. So it's three, it's the three day meal plan, which, and which is primarily like a therapeutic diet for, for the gut. So it's full of fermentable foods and lots of antioxidants and things that helps coat the gut and soothe the gut. And uh, it has a shopping list of all of you just kind of take it to your health food store, fill the shopping list and, and all the recipes on how to do it. And even has a calendar on how to like, on what days. So a lot of people will do, will, will get that. They'll make up their food for the entire week or the three days. And you can even triple it up and, and have your food for the entire week if you want. And, uh, and then carry it out. And it's fun foods that are easy to make. Um, and uh, that might be a little bit different than what you would normally eat. So that's on our website. And then uh, we usually send, um, we always, we send a, a nice um, webinar on our gut health, kind of the gut brain connection and bacterial overgrowths and just a presentation on with pictures and stuff on how that, uh, how our, how just explaining that and how we treat it as well. Cool. Is there is there a, a, a type of person who, who you think would be really, really get the best out of that? Is there a specific person who might be experiencing a certain certain symptom or, you know, or can any everybody benefit from it? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think someone who's just has uh, digest, you know, just wanting to support their digestive health overall would be a good candidate for that. And uh, and um, yeah, it's amazing. Just we always say like nutrition, our gut health, and my philosophy is kind of like the foundation of good health. So there's just it almost is like anybody can really benefit from just supporting themselves with foods. So it's a pretty broad spectrum one for for anybody that wants to just get going on their gut health. Awesome, beautiful, Nathan. That's great. Well, how can people connect with you? 
Well, just uh, through our website, perceptivehealth.ca is where you would go to. Um, and uh, we have our email and our phone number there. And you can connect to me with me through that. Perfect. And do you do, do you do remote sessions? Yeah, I do remote sessions uh, nowadays with telemedicine being so uh, popular. We do it. We, we can meet through like an online chat environment and uh, we can work on things that way as well. Perfect. Well, I'll make sure that all that information is available for our listeners. Um, thank you so much for taking the time today. I really appreciate it. It's, I think we, yeah, we could have spoken for hours about the gut brain connection and neurodiversity separately, like such massive new fascinating topics. So I really appreciate you, um, giving us kind of like the lowdown and introducing those topics to us with, with, um, you know, such great information. So I really appreciate your time today. Yeah. Well, it was nice meeting you and thanks uh, for having me. Of course. Thank you so much. Well, um, for more information about anything that we've spoken about in this episode, you can check out the show notes. Um, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't yet. Thank you so much for listening. This is True Hope Cast, the official podcast of True Hope Canada. We will see you next week. <laughs>